guess I don't need headphones. Apparently I'm live. Apparently. Is that working? Beep, beep, beep. Should be working. Hey, Fish Six. You can hear me okay? Hey, Sergio. Philip. Brian. Jim. Excellent. Good. So, uh, the plan is, um, to just hang out for an hour and answer your questions or, or whatever. Um, so I, I wanted to do like, almost like I've been having such a good time with the QA episodes that I figure it would be fun to do, um, kind of like a live version of that. And so my thought is, is like, you guys can ask me some question about say the red dragon, then I can go, Oh, you mean that? And then I can show pictures and I can, uh, bring up some, uh, some videos and, uh, and so on. So I was being live in accident. No, no. Uh, I wanted to, the, the plan was we don't really do anything on Mondays. So my thought was to maybe add a, do, start doing a live show on, on Mondays for an hour and at a different time. So we do all of our live shows at noon Pacific and a lot of people, uh, have school or they work. And so it's just not a good time for them to be able to hang out live. But this five o'clock, it's sort of the end of the day for the West coast it's like nighttime for the East Coast. It's not too ridiculous. Well, no, it is for Europe. It's terrible. But for the folks in Australia and stuff. So for a lot of the people that can never hang out live, because we're always doing this around noon, I figured I would just uh, set, some, set something else up. And I enjoy the live stuff. Uh, it really kind of keeps my brain going and gives me a much better sense of what kinds of topics and stuff people are interested in right now. And so I figured I would do that. Uh, so let's just get into it. So Dominican Jesse asks, what about the recent news with Tabby Starr? And, and that's a good point. So for anyone who doesn't know, of course, this is the, uh, the alien megastructure star, but it's most likely not um, alien megastructures. And what happened was in the last, um, man, with about a week ago, Tabitha Boyajin, who was the discoverer of the star, uh, of its strange behavior posted onto Twitter. And she was like, it's dimming right now, everybody. And sent this email out to the folks at Hubble and the folks at the Keck observatory and all these other observatories around the world. And, and so everyone did a bunch of a bunch of observations. And so we're still trying to we're still waiting to hear what happened. But because we got this next dimming event, it means that whatever happened with Tabby star is not a unique occurrence. It's something that's going to happen on some kind of uh, it seems to be some kind of regular basis. And sort of interestingly, at the exact same time, uh, literally within a day of when this alert went out, uh, Jason, Dr. Jason Wright, who is, uh, he's a planet ex yeah, yeah, as a planetary researcher that I've, uh, I've talked to in the past and he posted sort of two theories that are going on right now that he really liked. One is this idea that Tabby star is this, uh, like just a really giant planet and, and sort of, we're seeing it as it's passing and it's sort of dimming the star, but really big. Uh, the other idea is that it's some kind of weird, like a planet with rings, but then there's also Trojan asteroids that are in the system. So you've got this sort of really strange blocking of the light that happens at this regular basis. Or, of course, another panel of the alien megastructure has been completed, but nobody really, uh, nobody really believes that's the case. Although we all really hope in our hearts that that's what's going on. So... Uh, A.V. Scott and Flower, the Keck Observatory. So that is Keck, 
K-E-C-K. This is where I'm going to get you a picture. Let's see if I can do this. You hear my typey typey, but uh, let's see. So the Keck Observatory is pretty much the largest telescope that's ever been built on Earth right now. It's a 10 meter telescope. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. So it's a 10 meter telescope that's located in Hawaii. And there's a bunch of telescopes up here on the top of Mauna Kea. Uh, there's the Keck Observatories. There's the Gemini North Observatory. I think the Subaru Telescope is there as well. So there's a bunch of these telescopes. Uh, and they are, um, uh, have, you know, often will be used to observe this kind of thing. There's a whole new set of telescopes that are coming. These, the super telescopes we're calling, but this is sort of like the biggest telescope that's out there right now. There is a bigger telescope uh, with two uh, lenses, which is the giant binocular telescope, but the, but the Keck Observatory is a monster. Um, uh, Lane Potts, what are your thoughts of the theory of a wormhole in a black hole? You have to be more clear about that. Right now, wormholes are completely theoretical and no one has ever observed one. And, you know, people always ask this question of like, where do you go if you, if you like, if you go into a black hole and let me run a thought experiment for you. Okay. The earth is a ball of mass, right? It's a ball of rock. And if you were to jump from say, I don't know, 10 kilometers up towards the earth, they would fall from a mountain 10 kilometers up, where would you go, right? What To what other dimension would you travel? You wouldn't go anywhere. You would just splat into the earth and you would die, right? So the question is kind of nonsense to say, where do you go? Now let's say that the earth had more gravity. Let's say the earth was made of metal or maybe it was made of, of neutron star and you jump from 10 kilometers up and you fell down, where would you go? Right? You wouldn't go anywhere. You would just, again, just splat onto the surface of this, of this very heavy gravity. A black hole is just the next level. It's just, you, it's even more massive, even more gravity, even more compact. And again, if you jumped out, you would impact the black hole and you would go squish. And to wonder where you go, some other dimension, just because it's, now the gravity is so strong that it's even pulling its own light back into itself that doesn't turn it into a portal to another dimension. So that is the sort of, uh, that's the, that's the theory. All right. Um, P H 11. Let's just bring the question back down. Why don't you answer my questions on your QA videos? I feel insulted as your only follower from Argentina. Uh, well, I, I'm impressed. You know, thank you so much for following and asking your questions. I get about 500 questions, three to 500 questions every in between each question and answer cycle. So I haven't had a chance to answer most people's questions. But if you look, I'm often in there typing answers to the questions. So that's the that's the 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 simple you know, that's the simple answer is I don't have time to get to everybody's questions. But also the best questions are the ones that are short and ones that I can answer without having to do a lot of math. And so I tend to steer away from stuff that I'm then, you know, that I'm gonna have to sit down and, and prep a lot of material. So uh, I tend to try and answer stuff when I see them. I mean, have I not been answering your questions in the chat? If not, um, that's weird because I try to answer most questions in the chat. But let me know. Let me find another question. Oh, so zero x y z a b c x zero. Was Chris Cornell right about the black hole sun? Oh, we don't know, and it's really sad. You know, Chris Cornell uh, passed away like a week ago, which is super sad. He's gotten flower. So. Fraser, do you think that official space policy will be put forth for nuclear research in orbit around Luna? So in my next video, well, we just released a video to our patrons today, which is all about cosmic inflation. The next video after that is all about space law. And we talk a bit about, about space law. And 
in general, actually a huge chunk of the of the treaty they called the outer space treaty really doesn't want you to use nuclear weapons they're really about you can't put nuclear weapons into space you can't target them at earth you can't test them on the moon you really can't do anything about nuclear weapons so i would assume that if someone wanted to take some kind of nuclear uh, reactor things like that up into space it would probably fall under the concerns of the outer space treaty they would want to be sure that you're using a nuclear reactor and not a nuclear weapon so that is what I think is the uh, sort of uh, right now. That's probably what's going to happen is that it's going to fall under the you know aspects of that of that treaty. Um, Swiss milk. What do you think of the infinite reality with infinite versions of everything, everywhere, in every way? Uh, that's a great, that's a great question. This is one of the implications of an infinite universe. And there's a great way to think about it. like this, like I have a couple of like really mind bending things that I like to spin out on on people to really kind of expand their brain. And that is one of them. And so think of it like this, run this thought experiment, that if you have say, I don't know, a cubic meter of space, right, you've got a cubic meter of space. And Within that cubic meter of space, there is a set number of possible quantum positions and sort of situations, right? Within that one cubic meter of space. It's not an infinite number, it's a finite number. And what that means is that if you go far enough in an infinite universe, you're going to end up with a repeat, right? You're going to have the exact same, I forgot the number, it's like 10 to the power of 80. It's like, it's a, it's an enormous number and way beyond the size of, of the observable universe. But if you go much farther beyond that, you're going to get a repeat of that cubic meter of space. And then later on, you're going to get another, you know, repeat of the cubic meter of space, and so on and so forth. And the idea is that if you go far enough, you know, because we are about a cubic meter of space, that we're going to find this, this other version of ourselves, right? Because anything possible is going to reappear. It's going to be, you're going to get repeats as you go further and further out into the universe and forever. And in fact, you're going to get larger and larger things. You're going to be getting a cubic meter. You're going to get a cubic planet. You're going to be getting another galaxy. And so everything that exists, if you go out far enough in this infinite universe, will reappear an infinite number of times. And it's just right? It's just mind bending that right now, astronomers are still on the fence, whether we live in this infinite universe or this finite universe. And if we live in this infinite universe, then it's, uh, then, then this conversation, this exact conversation is happening. And also there's a conversation where I'm wearing a hat an infinite number of times and an infinite number of times where, where my eyes are a different color and every variation, but but the trick is that it has to be possible. So you can't get things that are impossible to happen in an infinite universe. You can only have things that are possible and whatever is possible will happen in an infinite number of times. I love it. It's a great idea. Mads Hogg Sorensen. Do you believe in humans on Mars before 2027? No. I don't. Uh, right now, in fact, I would say even the most bullish people on, on humans to Mars probably don't believe it. And now I'm going to be able to show off that picture of a red dragon. Let's do it. So here is an image of the red dragon capsule landing on Mars. And this is what was originally going to get sent by SpaceX in 2018. Um, but right now they've already said that they're going to push this, this landing back to probably 2020. And based on that, that pushes the whole system back. And the original idea for the Mars, uh, interplanetary transport, which is that really big one, it's going to carry between 80 and hundred people. They were planning, they were expecting that they were going to be launching that thing in 2024. So uh, right now we're looking at that getting pushed back. Say, say even that gets pushed back one window to say 2026, that is still uh, not within that same window. I mean, you're looking at maybe 2028 or maybe 2030. So it looks like we are, you know, I think right now, not by 2030, but maybe 2032, like, like 
it seems like SpaceX seems to really deliver the goods. Just things take a little longer than they were expecting. We were expecting the Falcon Heavy to have launched within a couple of years ago, and maybe it's going to launch this this summer. So I think that that it might be ten years too late, but still that would be mind bending. Hank Jacobs, where you have hair, lol. Uh, right here is where I have hair, and here on the side of my head, and not so much here. And that's because I went bald in my late 20s, and that will happen to you too, maybe. Look at your grandfather. That your, the, your mother's father will tell you whether you're going to keep your hair or whether you're going to lose it. David Green, should I read Prelude to Foundation first? I don't know. I haven't read it. <laughs> I've read the Foundation books, and I think the Foundation books are some of my absolute favorite books in all of science fiction. The, there's sort of two parts to it that I really enjoy. Um, one is just this idea that that someone can can think really far ahead and try and predict and plan for what the future is going to be. But also that it all goes wrong, and that's just wonderful with the with the whole Foundation series. So I highly, highly recommend the Foundation. I haven't read the Prelude, but I have definitely read the uh, you know the main three, and they're just they're just wonderful. The uh, but Jayway wants to know what would be my top suggestion for a sci-fi book. But my first sci-fi related because I didn't read much since I graduated high school. Like your first science fiction book. People in, throw some ideas in the comments. Foundation is a great one. I would highly recommend that. Uh, I like Snow Crash. I like the new 70s. I like anything by Neil Stevenson. Uh, yeah, go ahead and throw your comment, your suggestions in the comments of, of, of books that, that, that Jay should read. There's so many good stuff. Back on OPS. Fraser streaming this on Godly Hour because he knows his EU fans are his most dedicated fans. Right? Right? We almost always stream at noon Pacific. So this is, you know, for one time, I wanted to sort of stream that it's more appropriate for the people who are, you know, on my continent as opposed to the people in, um, in Europe. So that's my, that's my thoughts. Um, I got to I got to I got to fix not saying, um, so Stavros is saying hello from my neighbor province here in Alberta, which is awesome. A bunch of people are saying contact. A bunch of people are saying Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, I haven't read Neil deGrasse Tyson's new book. Rhyme and Treason. Whoa. If we ruled out dark matter being stars surrounded by von Neumann machines, what do you think is the likelihood of us being the first major intelligence? People just want to know this. We, I think we can rule out dark matter being von Neumann machines only because if you surrounded a star in some kind of thing like uh, satellites or spacecraft or robots or whatever that you would then, it would give off a glow in the infrared radiation which we would detect. And in fact, People have done a very detailed uh, survey of of the sort of of the universe, looking for entire galaxies that are surrounded, where it's like a Type Three civilization, where they've gathered up every single uh, star and turned them into Dyson swarms. Because you the whole you couldn't block, you couldn't hold in the infrared radiation, so you would see this leaking out into space and. And no one has been able to to see it, so so I think we can fairly confidently say that we don't right now see Type Three civilizations out there in the universe. We haven't seen Dyson spheres, therefore uh, that's off the table. Uh, are we first? I don't know. Um, either we're first, or there's something that destroys all intelligent civilizations, and we have yet to hit that thing. I, I would rather we were first than the thing than the second thing. People are recommending Stranger in a Strange Land, the Revelation series. I haven't read that series. Uh, the Martian by Andy Weir. Yeah, The Martian is a good one. Highly recommend The Martian, of course. 
uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. I liked the Mars series, which is really good. Hank Jacobs. Are there permanent health consequences to a long space trip like the one to Mars? Absolutely, there are long-term consequences. I forget the, the math of it, but the uh, you would expect a certain amount of uh, cancer, you know, so let's, let's go through the issues, right? First one is there's no gravity. So you're going to spend six months, eight months out from Earth to Mars in microgravity. We've seen now that that, that is fairly handleable, right, by the, by the twin experiment, and other people have been in space for that long. So I think being able to do that, handle that microgravity, as long as you exercised uh, on a regular basis, you would be able to survive that. Uh, the other issue is the is the radiation, of course, and although it wouldn't kill you, you would definitely get a much higher radiation load for being out in interplanetary space for eight months one way and eight months the other way and whatever time you spend down on the surface of Mars or in orbit around um, orbit around uh, Mars. And that would be an increased risk of cancer. There's other, apparently other um, cardiovascular issues, problems with your brain, problems with your eyes. So from what we know right now, making that long duration trip, although probably not fatal, is, is very bad for you. And, you know, you have to decide. I mean, a lot of people don't want to eat uh, certain kinds of food because, you know, they want to eat organic food as opposed to, you know, non-organic food because they're concerned that it's going to kill them right or they're worried about their cell phone so if you know you've got a much greater chance of getting uh, cancer if you do that there was a question there oh home muffin asks is this on twitch as well it's not on twitch but i had an idea for twitch which was i think i'm gonna do a uh uh, I'm going to do a movie marathon of our old episodes of The Guide to Space and just start with our first episode. Oh, it's so bad. And uh, just do a commentary and then and then do like two or three questions and then and then two or three episodes. And then, you know, next week do two or three episodes and just kind of keep doing that from, from week to week to week. So that's my plan on Twitch. And uh, But also I've got some collaborations planned with some some. Twitchers, is that what you call them? Twitch streamers, Twitchies, Twitchsters. Um, uh, e J S A and I are going to probably do something on the space shuttle, uh, and of course, it's, uh, Scott Manley, who I've hung out with now a couple of times. I'm the universe. Are you an atheist? Yes, I am. Uh, Jack Pollan wants to know about loop gravity and gut. Uh, that's uh, that's above my pay grade. Uh, you know, I might bring in a a ringer and do an episode on loop quantum gravity, but that's not my, um, yeah, that's not my, my forte. Remember I'm a journalist, not an astronomer. I've just been doing this job for 18 years. That's all. Meta nightmare asks, when do you think humanity will be <laughs> humidity? Humanity will become a full blown type one civilization. Oh, uh, so the definition of a type one civilization is a civilization has gathered all of the power of its host planet. And with fairly simple math, if you sort of extrapolate from our current energy, you know that it is uh, probably a couple hundred years from now, we're going to hit a type one civilization and, if, and like a thousand, two thousand years after that. We'll hit a type two civilization. I actually did a video on this. I forget the math, but but that is sort of the thinking is that we're not far based on our current energy usage and growth. So we'll see what will what will happen. But I, I think that this idea of the technological singularity that we are going to merge with our computers at some point takes makes the question a little weirder right that that you know uh, some people disagree with the time frame but most people can sort of see us becoming more and more augmented and advanced and and in the future and so does it really make sense to to say that we've become a type one civilization when the thing that has become a type one civilization is 
alien, you know, is our robot merged brethren? I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, like on the one hand, I imagine this wonderful Star Trek future where we're out there uh, exploring space with our spaceships and we're shooting our phasers and we're like beep, 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 opening up our, you know, communicators. But then there's sort of this other thought is like the advance of technology is going so quickly. And now we're even seeing the way AI is is moving into all aspects of our lives where we don't know what the implications of all this technology are and what we're going to become with CRISPR. We are, we are modifying our genetic code and creating new organisms from scratch. So, so we just, we're unequipped to truly imagine the future is my feeling. ABZ998, wouldn't it be better to focus on rotating space habitats large enough for millions instead of colonizing other planets? We get to pick the gravity, which is a big plus. Absolutely. And if you've watched a bunch of my stuff in the past, that is the, the feeling, that is sort of the direction that I feel is most likely, is we want to colonize the solar system, such as colonizing... Uh, Mars, but Mars is terrible. Mars is the worst, right? Mars is, is, it's the worst except for all the others. It has lower gravity. It has a terrible radiation environment. You can't breathe the air. It's cold all the time. There's nothing to eat. There's nowhere to go. It's just rocks and desert and sand and it's awful. And, and I think we want to explore the solar system and become a true uh, solar system spanning civilization, but what do we got to pick from, right? They they suck. So I do feel like the the long term future of humanity or long term future of space exploration, you know, assuming we avoid that singularity and the robot overlords that I mentioned, is this idea of of rotating O'Neill cylinders. And I will bring up one of those too because these are cool. And um, you know, this idea where you've got this huge, come on, little buddy. There we go. You've got this huge space station that is rotating with, it can let some of the sunlight in, but because of that rotation, you get centripetal force that allows you to um, sort of remain stuck to the outside. And you can have, you can make whatever environment you want. And the solar system has mountains and mountains of space. Uh, you wanted to know, uh, Stavros, have I considered inviting Kurgzagd? Yeah, I've, ta I've talked to Philip in the past. I actually wrote a script for one episode of the uh, of their of their series. If you look at the black hole episode, I I wrote that one. Well, I wrote a chunk of it, and and hopefully we can do a part two. That is, uh, they're great guys, but they're so busy, right? Like. Man, like I remember back in the day when they did their first one on the moons of the solar system or the moons of like Neptune. Yeah, and now they're just crazy busy. Let's get on David White. Have we gotten any closer to understanding the Great Attractor or taking steps in that direction? Absolutely. I think we've pretty much got the concept of the great attractor figured out and it's nothing weird it is that there happens to be a large galaxy cluster on the other side of the milky way and we know this because in the last de couple of decades we've developed much better telescopes and using infrared telescopes you can peer right through that gas and dust that obscures the center of the of the milky way and so we can actually see almost the entire other side of the Milky Way. And we can see all of those. Uh, we can see that giant galaxy cluster that's out there. So at this point, it's not that, you know, it's not that big of a mystery. It's not that, you know, there happens to be a large galac you know, galactic cluster, galactic mass on the other side of the Milky Way. And things are tending to slide towards it, which is what you would expect. Michael Cole, do you ever think that anything like Babylon 5 will ever happen, including the aliens? 
which I, the aliens well I, we don't know right are there aliens out there in space will we interact with them will we st again or will we be us or will we have merged with our computers and formed self-replicating robots that explore the universe I, I, all, most of the science fiction i you see i have sort of difficulty with this right that most of science fiction isn't really trying to tell the future it is trying to give you some perspective on what it means to be a human being in our current society. Babylon 5 was, was the United Nations, right? It is not actually what, how different alien civilizations would come together in this one place and, and interact with each other. We don't know what that would be. So it's a, I, I sort of feel like that is a fairly difficult uh, you know, whenever you think about various things that are said in science fiction, they're almost certainly wrong. You, you know that you have to sort of assume that now various things do happen to get developed, such as portable communication devices and, and various other technologies. But a lot of the sort of large things that come, that come along, like Star Trek, right? Their ability to talk to their computers was about roughly almost where we are now. And the computers are a little smarter than than they are now. But then other technologies like transporters and things like that. But the size of their communication devices was fairly small. So that's that. You know, I just feel like it's really difficult for us to say realistically what the future holds. But maybe that's what that's what Isaac Arthur's for. You watch his channel, and he'll he'll tell you what things are are realistic in the future. Although it'll be a fun conversation to have. Just this idea that. Everything is all this technology is accelerating so quickly that we really are starting to be unable to really predict what the future holds. Avi Scott in Flower, would I ever go to Mars? I would go to Mars, and this is I will go to Mars, and this isn't my quote. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said this that you know, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, after Elon Musk's mother comes back from Mars on a safe vacation trip. Right now, it's just way too dangerous. So I would wait until uh, it's safe. And I would not never want to live on Mars, right? Like here on Earth, we just step outside and we breathe the atmosphere. It's lovely. But if you wanted to go to Mars, it's brutal. So I will not, uh, I will not be looking to, uh, to move to, to Mars. I figure if you've got, if you're the kind of person, I think about this a bit, like if you're the kind of person that, that thinks moving to Mars is exciting and romantic and it's a, it's a challenge that you'd like to take on, there are a lot of challenges that you can do here on Earth that will test how willing and capable you are to suffer in a place that's very dangerous. Like go and build a cabin in the forest or go spend a summer living in uh, the in the Arctic or uh, build stuff from by hand like it like or work on a team to for Habitat for Humanity and to help build people houses like there are things that you can do if you think that that's a thing that you want to do that you can you can test out your personality and find out if you really are truly equipped if you go and and eke out this this subsistence living in the middle of the uh, Siberian tundra, then you might be cut out for exploring Mars. But if you go there and uh, two weeks in, you really wish you could just go for fast food, then you might not be cut out for it. Or if you don't like being around other people. So it's, I, I really think that that first generation of people, they are going to be pioneers to an extent that like the earth has never seen before like we've never known people who go out there and, and are willing to suffer that hard yeah yeah s and m 359 says go live in a coal mine in the arctic perfect right and that is a paradise that is a tropical garden compared to what awaits you on mars lane pots other than mars what huge plans does nasa have for the next 20 to 30 years I've got a video coming out about this, um, which is sort of like to turn that question on its ear, which is like, why don't we have any uh, 20 to 30 year plans? Why, why haven't we got any big plans? And if you look back in the last 
um, couple of decades, right? Like we've gone through, there was the constellation plan to send humans to the moon. There was other plans back in the 1980s to send people to the Mars. There, to Mars, there's this idea to send humans to an asteroid, people to bring back uh, stuff from, you better be careful, Redstone Craft Guy, that gets you banned. Um, so, so I know you're kidding, but there's others might ban you. Um, uh, right. So, uh, you know, we've got, so there's all of these different missions that have, that have been proposed and each one has essentially gotten canceled. And now we're in the Orion phase of this and, and that humans are going to be going back to Mars in the next 30 years. And the problem is, is that that is such a long term duration plan that you're going to get new governments coming in and they're going to change the plans. And, and so no plan can really survive that long of a planning process that the John F. Kennedy, you know, we choose to go to the moon. That was eight years. He was like, I think we should go to the moon. And eight years later, people were set putting their, uh, were setting foot on the moon. And that is a very quick, tight plan. So the thing that I propose is what's called a capabilities, capabilities based exploration. And what that means is that you instead of trying to um, pick some specific plan, like we're going to go to the moon, or we're going to go to Mars, you instead work on just building up your overall infrastructure of what your space program is capable of doing. Uh, a good example is like back in the Gemini program and into the uh, into the Apollo program, you had uh, you know, we're going to do a spacewalk. Now we're going to do a spacewalk for, for three hours. And now we're going to try docking a spaceship. And now we're going to talk, you know, each time they just continue to extend and we should have been continuing to extend our capabilities. Now there may be that there's going to have to be new launch, you know, launch capabilities developed. We're going to need a better rocket. We're going to need a, um, uh, we're gonna need a better rocket, you're gonna need better life support, you're gonna need various things one after the other. But as long as you keep on with that capability and growth, then you never feel like you're spinning your wheels or just going around the earth because you every six months, every year, you've got a new milestone that you're looking to accomplish. Each one is the next logical milestone from what you already do. And once anything becomes understood and and fairly easy, you then pass that off to private space industry, give all that technology over to that next generation of space planners. So that is, that is, you know, if I was running NASA, which, you know, as a Canadian, I, I can't, uh, that's what I would do is just this iterative capabilities based approach of, of increasing our ability in space. And so you can imagine if they just kept going back from the 1970s and just kept improving capabilities, who knows where we'd be. Um, and, and people, this is the joke, the joke that we always have here on, on the weekly space hangout anyway, is, you know, is being able to make a recipe that if you have all the ingredients for a recipe at hand in your house, then it's easy to make that thing. But if you're like, say you want to make pancakes and you decide, Oh, I want to have big pancakes. If you don't have any ingredients, you're going to go to the store and you're going to buy all the ingredients. You're going to bring them home. You got to make pancakes. But if you always have all the stuff on hand, then when you decide you want to make pancakes or capture an asteroid, you have all of that capability at hand. That is my, that is my feeling. Uh, a physics teacher asks, do you have a favorite of the up and coming earth based telescopes based on the cool tech data volume and resolution? Absolutely. Uh, and that is the LSS. LSST, and I will bring up a picture of that, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is going to be, uh, let me get a good shot of it. This one's good. Let me bring up a picture of the LSST. Yeah. This thing is going to be a very, very large telescope, but the thing that's amazing is that it's going to be a very, very fast telescope. And what, and what astronomers mean by fast is that it's going to be able to take pictures of the night sky very rapidly within a two days I think it's going to it's going to image the entire night sky and then two days later it's going to image the entire night sky again and what that's going to give you is this really nice uh, I 
you know, understanding of what has changed in, in the sky. And that's going to help us really understand what the universe is doing when we're not looking. I did an episode about this. It's called what does the universe do when we're not looking? And I also interviewed the, one of the lead, uh, investigators from the LSST project on the weekly space hangout. And that was a lot of fun because I, I wanted to talk to them about what this program is going to do. I'm really excited about it. It's going to, it's going to help us find asteroids. It's going to help us find Kuiper belt objects, maybe help us find new planets within our solar system. It's going to help us find, um, new supernova. It would, it would find things like tabby star across the sky. So it's a pretty great, uh, potential. Uh Oh, someone's at the door. Hold on one second. I'm just, that's what you get when you do this live. All right. All right. Get on with the next question here. Um, so the A-Physics teacher asking, is it quick to respond to events like gamma ray bursts? No, because the it's going to, it's not, it doesn't respond to anything. It just takes photos of the entire night sky, just everything that it can see from its vantage point. So it's not going to be taking any individual image. It's going to be taking images of every single thing, which is just kind of amazing. Yeah, I am Babrin. Are you excited for NASA's Solar P Probe Plus? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a pretty exciting mission that's going to be happening. So I think it's, man, 2022? Um, yeah, there's going to be a mission that's going to go to the sun. It's going to have like a uh, this really cool reflective sheet on the front of it that's going to block a lot of the light coming from the sun, and it's going to give us a much closer view of the sun that we've ever had. I'm, it's pretty exciting. Swiss milk. Can you do some live events for JWST launch and after? Maybe. Uh, we did a live event back in 2012 for the Curiosity Landing, and it was a lot of fun, and it was a lot of work. We, we went for about three hours, I think. You can find it early, early on in the channel. And we... Uh, it was, but we had tons of like superstar guests who came on with us and to talk with us. Uh, it was really fun and really exciting and I really enjoyed it. And so we thought about doing other stuff as well. Uh, what we kind of did was we just took the raw feed from NASA and then just fired it back through, uh, the hangout and then did that. And so I think we'll, you know, I, I want to definitely get back to doing more of those live events and I think we'll, you know, we'll, we'll look to, to do some more. If you guys want to do JWST, then, then sold. Let's do, let's do James Webb. But there's, there's some other stuff coming up sooner, like the death of Cassini, which is going to be happening in September. So maybe we'll do that then. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. <clears throat> Avros wants to know, is Deimos a danger for the Martians? Uh, Deimos or Phobos? Phobos is the one that's the danger for the Martians. That's the one that's going to, uh, it's getting closer and closer and closer to Mars, and it's going to break up and collide with Mars in the next few dozen million years. Uh, Deimos is, is drifting further away, so it's not going to be a problem for, for it. Mike K, hey, any thoughts on bringing back the Virtual Star Party? Yes, there are plans to bring back the Virtual Star Party in some form. The problem is that trying to organize all of these amateur astronomers every week was just so difficult. So for those who don't know, <clears throat> the uh, the Virtual Star Party was was an event that we did a, a few years ago, and so every Sunday night we would we would get a bunch of astronomers live streaming from their local event, from the local you know their location from with their telescope, and then we'd bring all those streams into this one hangout, and then I would be able to just sort of switch back and forth to the different telescopes and talk to the astronomers and see what's going on, and um, it was super fun, but it was it was. We got to a point where it was just it was too hard 
to get every single one of the astronomers lined up and in place and 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 so on so i, I think we're going to bring it back in a different format which is that we're going to uh, partner up with one of the virtual telescope groups like there's the folks at uh, slu or i telescope there's a bunch of those and try and get some like dedicated telescope that we can get access to and then at the same time maybe you know interview or bring on some some astrophotographers and have them sort of show their work and then have some live astronomers but have it not be as dependent on the night sky or the you know clear skies and cloudy skies across the world so that's the plan i think but it's just another thing to organize and coordinate so you know take a number let's see Tom Robin, uh, what do you think about 16 Psyche, the metal asteroid worth $10 quadrillion that could crash the global economy? Uh, <laughs> wait, like, it happens to be a asteroid made of metal, thought to be the core of some partially destroyed protoplanet. And at the same time, the that's sort of like one factoid and another factoid is that it's got say 10 quadrillion dollars worth of metals in it which is an interesting fact uh nasa is going to be sending a mission to this asteroid which is a fact uh 10 quadrillion dollars worth of metal would crash the global economy which is a fact but those four things are not connected in other words nasa is sending a mission to psyche not to mine it, but to visit it and take pictures of it. To mine an asteroid of that size and scale is mind-bending, right? Uh, so that's the sort of the first. That's the first thing. Uh, so I wouldn't be concerned about it, except that it'll be amazing to see pictures of that place up close. And I actually have a chunk, not of Psyche necessarily. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Here we go. So. I've got some metal meteorites, which I love. And I got a whole bunch of them. And I uh, give people meteorites uh, sometimes. It's happened. Just saying. Uh, we did a... Isaac Arthur, Arthur and I are going to be doing a new collaboration in about two weeks. And the person who gave us the idea is going to be getting a meteorite. So, and that is, and that is what it's like, but a whole planetoid worth of metal. But as Jim Meeker says, you know, when planetary resources gets to 16 Psyche, then we'll cross that bridge. Yeah. Right now there are a couple of, of, there's three companies that are hoping to maybe do space mining someday, but right now the, the level of technology and the level of capability is very low and, and there are still sort of space law hurdles, although that's been helped out in the last little while uh, with a new law that came out in 2015. But yeah, we're so far away from being able to pull like a single rock. Like the OSIRIS-REx is going to bring a rock back. That's it. And as Bill Drone is saying, the miners wouldn't bring the the material back to to. Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't crash the market, but I would bet they wouldn't even bring it back to Earth. The whole point of mining something in space like an asteroid is to keep those minerals and metals in space because that's the hard part. The hard part is getting that stuff off the surface of the Earth and up into space. If you can bring that stuff from space and keep it up in space, then you can build all kinds of, of things. That's the real value to that. So I don't think we'll ever see. You know, might crash the space market. Hey, Fraser, who do you think is more technologically advanced, NASA or CNSA? Is that the Chinese space agency? Is that CNSA? Uh, NASA is, or is that the Canadian, right, the China, the China National Space Administration? The, uh, or the, is it the Canadian Nursing Students Association? I'm going to guess it's the Chinese. Uh, the, the NASA is way, way beyond uh, the capabilities of the Chinese. Although right now the Chinese can launch humans into space, which is an interesting accomplishment. But, but in general, NASA has 
70 years of or 60 years of experience in in launching human beings into space and keeping them alive and putting them on the space station and all that kind of stuff china has only really got into the game in the last couple of uh you know within the last decade but the chinese are serious they are you know, they don't have this problem of shifting priorities. My guess is they've got a very well laid out plan of where they're going to be going, the steps they're going to be doing, the milestones are going to be taking, and it's going to be, you know, that's going to be compared. They're learning, you know, the first thing they got, you know, they put a human into space, and then they put a couple of humans in space, and then they put a space station, and then they've docked to the space station, and they had people up on there, and then they sent a rover to the moon, and then they sent an unmanned spaceship around the moon, right? They're, they are on their way to putting humans on the moon. When that happens, we still don't know, but I would definitely not be surprised if the next major human event is when the Chinese set foot on the moon or when uh, humans step off the spaceship from, you know, the Elon Musk, the SpaceX uh, interplanetary transport ship. That's what I think is going to happen next. Uh, okay, complete chaos. If gravity travels at the speed of light, are we attracted to where the sun was uh, eight minutes ago instead of where it is now? If not, why? If so, how does it affect our orbit around the sun? But that's right. So gravity travels at the speed of light. And the way to think about that is that if the sun disappeared, then we would, it would take eight minutes from when the sun disappeared to when we drifted off into space. And that is, uh, that's just sort of the reality of, of the way, you know, relativity, gravity, general relativity works. It's just this idea that, that gravity, the, the force of gravity, the distortion of space time moves at the speed of light. I mean, I, I don't understand the sort of the second part, but like, uh, does, you know, is it pulling? Yeah, we are experiencing the gravity of eight minutes ago from the sun. Right. There you go. A physics teacher says CNSA, fifteen moon in fifteen years. Yeah, that sounds that sounds it would not be surprising to me if the Chinese put humans on the moon in fifteen years. Absolutely. Cambria three nine nine. Can we visit Mars without contaminating contaminating with Earth microbes? Uh, a while ago we would have said yes. Like, like there's going to be, you know, that that this idea of us contaminating Mars is almost impossible, that nothing can survive on Mars. But now we're finding that there are Earth life forms, there's methanogens, these little bacteria, and there's also uh, lichen that can survive on Mars right now. And even if they have, a, you know, a source of warmth, if they have a, a source of energy, they could thrive on Mars. So at this point, it's pretty likely that if we did go to Mars, we would infect it to some degree with our life form. Question is, really, the question is of whether this is an ethical issue is, is there life already on Mars? And if so, are we okay with killing it or infecting it? Or is it going to, because it's, you know, because the Mars life is so well suited to its to its environment, does our life stand a chance to be to to compete against it in the environment that's on Mars? But I think it's a really interesting question, right? Or same thing with Europa or Enceladus, that if we do find that there's a life there, what is our obligation to not contaminate those worlds? And that goes back to why I think that, you know, might very well be that that orbital colonies are the best place for us to go. As Eric W says, we've all probably already contaminated it. If there's no life there, then I say, let's go crazy. Let's colonize it. Let's seed it with our own life. In fact, it's our duty to to give it our you know our own life. But if there is already life there, I think it's probably ethically the right thing to do is to stay back and 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 not interact with those worlds for a while. But I also know the way human beings are, which is like we don't really care, right? Unfortunately, human beings are just. They don't really care too much about the implications of 
of seeding life. Human beings are f fairly, uh, you know, short sighted and we've got this scotch broom everywhere here thanks scotland um and it's just gone crazy because someone thought hey it'd be nice to have some scotch broom in my garden here on vancouver island and now the stuff's taken over the whole island it's everywhere so that's how we work someone thought it'd be fun to have a cool plant in their garden and now that's the only plant we've got A physics teacher asks, how do you categorically prove the absence of life? You, well, that is the problem, right? So you, if we decide that we're going to take an ethical, if we're going to take an ethical, that is not ethical for us to destroy the life on Mars or on other planets in the worlds in the solar system, then how do we prove that they are sterile? And, and that's what we are doing is is exploring these worlds and putting, but the things that we use to explore these worlds have the potential of contaminating these worlds. So the, I, I, anyway, this is going to be a video. Obviously I, I have a lot of opinions, no, no answers, only questions, but I want people to at least just kind of go, just admit, yes, we're gonna kill the life on those worlds and we don't care. Right? Like that's in, in the end, we know that's what's going to happen. And I want us to at least walk into it knowing that that's what we, that that was the ethical decision that we decided to make. Bill Pease, do you have any major flaws with Elon Musk's plans to send people to Mars? I, I don't think it's a good idea to bet against Elon Musk and SpaceX, right? Like, like they made a rocket land on its launch pad. Or land on a drone, like land on a barge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Like, how, how do you question and poke holes in their engineering capability? They, this is just super impressive, right? Uh, so will the rocket that they've developed work? I don't know. But if they've done the math, you kind of have to assume that, that they're on the right track. Um, so I think the deeper question really is, and this is where I'd love to have that argument with Elon Musk, is just like, is is colonizing, like I agree with him that we need a backup for humanity. And that backup means that we can't live on planet Earth. We can't all live on planet Earth. The question is, is the right place for that backup to be on Mars? You've got this ethical contamination problem. You've got the... Um, you've got the sort of like Mars sucks problem with the low gravity and the radiation and the lack of air and nothing to eat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those are a bunch of things, reasons why Mars is not such a good idea. But we need to master living in orbit. We need to master living outside the gravity well of planet Earth. And so toward up to me, uh, I think that we should focus a lot more energy on getting orbital habitation right in terms of creating artificial gravity through rotation figuring out how to block radiation that's coming from space creating closed um uh, environments that produce food and water and 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 air and recycle through around and around and around i think that is the uh that is what we need to focus our our energy on personally but I totally get that they, that that Mars has a lot of good stuff good stuff going for it. All right. Well, I hate to hate to say this, but we're actually wrapping up at the end of this hour. It's been super fun, but I also want to sort of try to constrain it to an hour uh, and just make a like an on the fly questions and answers. So I think I will I will try to do this again next week. We've got a busy schedule coming out this week. You probably saw we just posted a whole episode about fusion and when when fusion is going to be happening. We have just uh, to the patrons, they're seeing an episode on cosmic inflation, and that's going to probably go to everybody tomorrow. We've got another QA with some great questions, a bunch that we actually talked about here today, which I think I guess I'm guessing that a bunch of you showed up and asked your question again here in the live thing. So the QA actually has a lot of very similar questions. Uh, and then on Thursday, we've got an episode about space law. And then uh, next week, we're talking about, uh, well, we'll get we'll handle next week when we get there. So thank you, everybody for watching this. If you want to give a thumbs up, that would be awesome. 
And I let me know if this worked for you, if this is the a kind of format that you enjoy. I know it's a lot less scripted, a lot less um, prepared, but at the same time, I can interact back and forth with you folks. So uh, thanks for hanging out with me. We'll see you all later.